New World Order uh, Bible versions, the video, wanted to play you some clips and respond to them. Um, what we have in this video really is one of the best examples of King James only preaching. You know, for years I've been saying, well, King James only preachers, they will preach this. They will stand for other people and they will preach 1 Timothy 3.16. They'll never talk about John 1.18. They'll never talk about Revelation 1. But they'll preach 1 Timothy 3.16. Well, now I can just show you that happening. <laughs> now I can show you King James only preachers giving you only a part of the truth and not all the truth. And demonstrate very easily their double standards. And again, King James onlyism cannot exist without double standards. You apply one standard to King James, you apply another standard to the modern translations, that's what King James onlyism is. And that's why it is dying. Because people see that, and because so few people are being raised in the King James that they have the emotional attachment to even be able to survive the kind of harangues that are normally uh, a part of King James only preaching. But uh, here's... here's uh, uh, well, let me just play this, and then I'll I'll respond to each each thing as we uh, as we go along. And it's a satanic agenda to change the Bible. A lot of people just think, well, the King James Bible is a great translation. It's it's very poetic, and these other versions are inferior. Maybe they're not as well translated. But I'm here to tell you, it goes much deeper than that. These new versions are actually Satan's attempt at corrupting the Word of God. I'm going to show you that these changes are not just accidental, they're not just minor, inconsequential changes. I mean, these changes are strategic changes. They are calculated to attack specific doctrines that the Bible teaches. The Bible tells in Ephesians 6.12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. There are people who have many millions and even billions of dollars who have an agenda to put out corrupted Bibles and then promote them through advertising, promote them through retail stores that will put them front and center and that will show people this is the Bible you ought to be reading. Get rid of the King James Bible. Get the newer, better, improved version. Now, I did... So... <clears throat> There's, there's, you, you know, some music in the background. Got the, got the conspiracies and, and all the rest of this stuff. Now, are there bi bad Bible versions? Yes, there are. Um, do we have too many English Bible translations today? Yes, we do. Uh, those aren't issues. What's very concerning, and one of the reasons that I began addressing this many, many years ago, what, 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 what motivated me even before writing the King James Only Controversy, was I saw as a young man in Bible college that this perspective not only split churches and, and did great damage along those lines, but that this movement likewise uh, hamstrings any person from being able to give a meaningful, full defense of the key doctrines of the Christian faith, especially regarding the deity of Christ. And that is about the only argument that is made at the beginning of this movie. I mean, there's, this movie is pitifully shallow in its argumentation. Pitifully shallow. But the one section it tries to make a case on is, say, the modern translations attack the deity of Christ. This is the one subject I am absolutely pos positively confident. None of these people. I could get Anderson and everybody in this film and, and everybody... All the King James only guys together, they can all get together. I'll take 10 of them on at the same time. It doesn't make any difference. This is the one subject they cannot survive in because it's simply untrue. None of them are on the front lines debating Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, Muslims, people like that that are denying the deity of Christ. They, just, they don't even know what the issues are. But the facts on this subject are beyond question. Beyond question. And so what you've got to do is you've got to get people into a conspiratorial mindset so they don't start examining your arguments. So they start off talking about missing verses. 
Now, no, did you did you catch? By the way, and again, I, I I can't assume that everyone listening has read the King James Only controversy. I know that Stephen Anderson has read the King James Only controversy, so he knows what the facts are on every single thing said in this film, and he never raises the responses. He knows the errors that he is prom- promoting, but he never even tries to defend his position. That's reprehensible. Reprehensible. I cannot, be- I cannot even begin to understand how someone can behave in that way. I, I just don't understand it. I just don't understand it. Um, he knows what the responses are. There is nothing in this film that is raised by these men that was not thoroughly refuted in 1994 in the King James Only Conversion. Okay, it came out in 95. I wrote it in 94. Nothing. Zip. Nada. They raised nothing. And nor do they even try. Evidently, they have absolute confidence that the people that they want to see this are never going to take the time to see what the answers are. Because as I'll, I'll point out to you, there are some real holes in the argumentation. But let's take a look at uh, missing verses. Missing verses. The NIV is missing 16 entire verses. Now, I stopped there for just a moment. Did you catch that? Change, 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 the previous clip. Now, missing, missing, what's the standard, King James? If you change the standard, look at all the things that have been changed in the King James. Look at all the added verses. See, it all depends on the standard you adopt, and you've got to defend your choice of that standard, which they don't do. From the New Testament. I mean, just right out of the gate, before we talk about all the thousands of changes, just 16 verses are completely missing. Matthew 17, 21, gone. Matthew 17, 21, gone. That's because it is a parallel corruption from Mark 9, 29, which is there. Why don't you tell them that? Why don't you tell them that it's a later scribal error where a scribe familiar with the wording found in Mark chapter 9, just probably because he has it memorized, fills in, harmonizes Matthew with Mark. How come the very same materials in Mark 9, 29, Pastor Anderson? If there's some great conspiracy, the music seems to indicate it, if there's some great conspiracy, why is it still in Mark 9, 29? Oh, well, if you, it needs to be repeated many times for us to get it. Really? It's in Mark 9, 29. Which is easier to recognize? That a scribe familiar with the Mark and form would harmonize Matthew to it? Or that there is some great conspiracy to only take out one reference to a verse when it's repeated elsewhere, but leave that one in? <sighs> okay. Matthew 18, 11, Gone. Act- That's because... That's a parallel corruption. Parallel passage, Luke 19.10. Same material, same arguments, same situation. Why not mention that? Why not mention that? Oh, because it wouldn't help us to promote our theory. 837. That verse is gone from the NIV, gone from the ESV, gone from the New Living Translation. Now listen to how much they do with this. Acts 837. They're going to they're gonna hammer away on this one. Completely gone. Acts 836, King James Bible. And as they went on their way, they came onto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What does hinder me be baptized? And Philip, that's the soul winner, said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. So the eunuch, that's the sinner, says, What's hindering me? What's stopping me from getting baptized? Philip, the soul winner, says, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he, the eunuch, answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. What just happened to the eunuch? He got saved. Why? If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised from the dead, thou shalt be saved. He believed in his heart, he confessed with his mouth, he got saved. So what they do? Verse 38, and he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. So verse 36, what's stopping me from getting baptized? Verse 37, as long as you believe you can get baptized, he confessed with his mouth, believes in his heart. Verse 38, they baptize him. Amen. What does the New International Version say? As they travel along the road, they came to water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of me being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. Now, did you just catch what happened? What was missing? I don't know if you noticed. The entire verse 37 was missing. So according to the New International Version, they're going down the road, 
He says, what's stopping me from getting baptized? According to the NIV, nothing. Let's just baptize you. What's missing? Believe on Jesus Christ. What's missing? The gospel. What's missing? Why are these Bibles attacking Jesus Christ? The reality, of course, is um, that the vast majority of Greek manuscripts, including the Byzantine manuscripts, do not contain Acts 8.37. How did it get into the text of Sheseptus? Well, Erasmus admitted. He inserted it from the Latin Vulgate. Yes, the Latin Vulgate, the Bible of the Roman Catholic Church. The Bible that Rome actually said was inspired and inerrant at one point. That's where it came from. It came from the Latin Vulgate. So, is the Latin Vulgate our ultimate authority now? Why not tell folks? Well, you know, um, Greek manuscripts, well, the, the vast majority of them don't contain this text. Um, and the ones that Erasmus had didn't contain it either, but it was in the Latin Vulgate. And so the official translation of the Roman Church is the foundation for the insertion of this text. Why not tell them that? Why not be open and up front and tell them where it really comes from? Well, because that doesn't help you when you're trying to promote a conspiracy theory. Conspiracy theories require something more than that. Well, now let's look at the next one. The ever popular comma Johannium. Believe that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. Amen. This is something that these modern versions constantly change and attack. Let me give you some examples. First John 5, 7, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. That's where we get the word Trinity. Three in one. These three are one. The NIV, on the other hand, just says, for there are three that testify. Doesn't mention the Father, doesn't mention the Word, doesn't mention the Holy Ghost, and does not mention that the three are one. Look what Now, Stephen Anderson knows, he knows, he's read the book, that if the Kami Ohanim is original, we have no confidence whatsoever that we actually possess the original writings of the New Testament. None. Because what it means is an entire verse could simply disappear. Disappear from the entire Greek manuscript tradition and only be found in the Latin Vulgate. And hence, Rome's been right all along. We should, uh, we should well, they don't believe it anymore, but they were, uh, that we should uh, depend upon the Latin Vulgate. If he was consistent, he doesn't care about being consistent. That's irrelevant. All, in fact, well, I'll take that back. He does care about being consistent, but he's not being consistent in this movie. He shouldn't even be bothering to present arguments because from his perspective, it, the issue isn't the arguments. He starts with the supremacy of the King James Version, and then you just cobble stuff together from there. But it, it's not a matter of actually convincing anybody on the basis of argument. That's where you start. It's a presupposition. So he knows that this comes from Latin Vulgate. He knows it's not a part of the Greek manuscript tradition. He knows that it was inserted into uh, Codex Monfortianus in 1520, just simply to refute Erasmus. Um, he knows all of this. And that if you take the position that it's original, you are fundamentally capitulating to Bart Ehrman. You are. You may not want to admit it, but a rational person, an honest person, recognizes you are basically saying, we do not have any confidence whatsoever. None that we really do possess in the manuscript tradition as a whole, even in the Byzantine manuscripts, because this is a this is not a Byzantine reading. The majority text rejects it. It was not in the first two editions of Erasmus. It was only inserted into the third. They know these things, but they won't tell their people these things. Instead, they will play upon emotion. We believe Jesus is God. Well, yes, he is. But I think you are using that in a desperately dishonest way. When you teach your people in such a way that they believe the truth, but they believe it for the wrong reasons. You're just using it as a club. You're using it as, a, as an emotional trigger. Nothing more. And that really concerns me. It's one of the reasons we do what we do. 
I believe in the deity of Christ, but I think you should be able to defend it truthfully and honestly rather than deceptively, which is what, um, which is what you've got going on here. Then, like I said, you want to you want to preach, you want to preach First Timothy three sixteen. Here's how it here's how it works. Look what they've done with First Timothy three sixteen. The Bible reads, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Watch this. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. It was God that was believed on in the world. It was God that was received up into glory. It was God who was made flesh and dwelt among us. And the Bible is crystal clear in 1 Timothy 3.16 that Jesus Christ is God. In 1 Timothy 3.16, it's an important passage because I would often read the footnotes in the New American Standard that I had in seminary and later on in the NIV and other passages. And they would say in the footnotes, or they would say in their commentaries, or those teaching from the NIV or the New American Standard, they'd say that there isn't any difference in theology. It doesn't affect any doctrinal perspectives. But obviously there's a difference between Haas and Theos. If you take as he who was Haas instead of Theos, instead of it being God, it obviously weakens the text because right. you have to assume that Christ is God or right. made manifest. But in Theos, there's no wondering about what the text says. It's right. God who was manifest in the flesh, and that's got to be the person of Christ. And that certainly influences people's thinking on the deity of the Lord Jesus. Right. Another great proof. Okay, uh, now keep that in mind. So there, there you've got, see, they're trying to take out the deity of Christ. God was manifest in the flesh. Modern translations say he who was manifest in the flesh. And most of our folks are sort of left going, um, now we actually talked about this just a couple weeks ago. Um, and remember, I showed you what the actual difference between Theos and Haas is. But keep that in mind. Keep that preaching in mind. And then check out this little statement from Pastor Anderson. Not only that, they attack his eternal pre-existence. See, Jesus Christ did not come into being in Bethlehem's manger. Jesus Christ did not come into being in the womb of Mary. But rather, Jesus Christ has always existed and always will exist. He is the first and the last. He is the Alpha and Omega. He is the beginning and the ending. And that's Did you catch that? Did you catch that? He quotes from the book of Revelation. And of course he's right. He's right. Just one little thing that he missed. You see, if there is consistency, and this is why I know King James onlyism is false. This is why it cannot ever withstand examination. Because it is inconsistent. You cannot define the word truth. There's some Muslim on, uh, on Twitter that just hates me because I keep pointing out the use of inconsistency by Muslim apologists. But as I've pointed out to him, you cannot define the word truth without using the word consistency. You can't do it. If he was consistent, then he would have to explain Revelation 1.8. Revelation 1.8. Now take a look at it. Go ahead and get your King James out. Here's the King James. This is starting in verse 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. So we know who this is talking about, right? And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. That's King James. That's King James. Um, there's something um, there's something missing. In the Greek, it says, Legai ha kudios, ha on kai ha ein, kai ha erkamenos, ha pantakrator. Says the Lord, who was who who is and was and is to come the almighty but in the nestle Olland greek text not the tr of scrivener in the nestle Olland text it says legai kudios ha theos ha on kai ha ein kai ha erkamenos ha pantakrator 
So modern translations say, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, the one who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. The word God. Let me go ahead and use the Pastor Anderson preaching mode. The word God has been taken out. No. Wasn't taken out. I mean, if I wanted to preach against King James onlyism, that's what I would do. I would use the emotions, but you see, I can't do that. I honor the truth. Unlike Pastor Anderson, who does not. It's not a matter of being taken out. The fact of the matter is, Erasmus had a lot of problems with the book of Revelation. That's all there is to it. A lot of problems. He had to borrow a commentary. All he had was a commentary on the book of Revelation, and he had to extract the Greek from the commentary. And he was in a hurry. And he did it in a rushed way. And he made mistakes. That's all there is to it. Yeah, I know, I know that doesn't sell books. No one's going to be knocking down my door to make a movie about the mistakes Erasmus made in the book of Revelation. You don't sell DVDs when you just tell the truth. But that's the reality. And the fact is, the far better reading is Lord God. Jesus identified as God in Revelation 1.8. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses say there's a break between 1.7 and 1.8, and this is just all of a sudden God himself starts speaking here at the end. That's how they get around it, by the way. But they're wrong. But Jehovah's Witnesses are wrong, and Anderson's wrong. He knows Jesus is the Alpha and Omega. Why doesn't he tell his folks that, well, you know, King James... Uh, <laughs> Y'all remember uh, Tex Mars, Revelation 1, 1, 1, <laughs> that kind of stuff? King James onlyism does not produce a lot of, of honesty on the part of its proponents. And if you ever hear a King James onlyist banging away on 1 Timothy 3.16, and they don't turn around immediately and deal with Revelation 1.8 and John 1.18, then they're not honest. Because John 1.18, King James has only begotten son, whereas the earliest manuscripts we possess all say monogenes theos, the unique God. And don't give me, oh, that's what the Gnostics said, baloney. Show me a place the Gnostics ever used that phrase. I know Green said it. Show me. Prove it. Back it up. Go to the original sources. You can't, and you know it. You know it. So, two places where the modern Greek text identified Jesus as Theos, King James does not. Revelation 1.8, John 1.18. And as I showed you, and I, I suppose, eh, I've got time. Let me pop it up here real quick. I'll show it to you again, just so we can make sure that we've got it. Um, as I showed you before, the variation. Now they showed you. Did, let, let me, you know, let me uh, da, 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 open recent New Testament documents plus. Um, while that's coming up, let me see if I can roll back here in the uh, screenshot uh, to First uh, Timothy three sixteen. Let me see if I can find it. There, there. Can you get that screenshot? All right. Now, I don't know what manuscript this is. Looks possibly like Alexandrinus. I'm not sure. But what they've got circled here is the os. And I'm, this is why I think it is Alexandrinus. I, I didn't take the time to look it up. I've got Alexandrinus. I could pull it up and, and take a look at it in, in accordance, but that would really mess my screen up. Um, that clearly is the os because you have the nomina sacra line right there. But what I showed you before 
I will bring up and I will switch over to the proper um, the proper thing here. Window. Uh, do, 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 window, and we want uh, Keynote, New Testament Documents Plus. You should have it now. You have a what? You got it? Okay. Here is the difference between God and he who. Um, in fact, let me back it up a screen. Here is in capital unsealed text, God, he, who, there's the os, there's hos, blow it up. You can see the difference, theta sigma with a line over top versus omicron sigma without a line over top. Orthographically, they're almost identical to one another. It's easy for an English speaking person to say there's a big difference between he, who, and God. It's two different words, one word, no. And the original majuscule text that was used for the first 800 years, the history of the New Testament, the difference would be very small and easily understandable why a scribe could confuse the two. Again, this doesn't sell DVDs. You can't play spooky music behind it. It wouldn't make any, any difference right now if I had going on behind because it isn't that exciting. It's just the facts. It's true. And sometimes the truth, it's just true. It's just the way it is. So once again, um, if you are going to make this kind of argumentation, if you're going to stand in front of an audience and tell them, look, this is what's going on. These people are trying to change things. Just be honest. Don't deceive them. Everyone sitting in that room that day with Anderson preaching to them about 1 Timothy 3.16, their ability to actually defend the Christian faith was diminished by his preaching, not enhanced. That's why I deal with this. That's why I deal with this. Let's look at one more. we got time to look at one more. Uh, alleged issue here that I thought they really stumbled on badly. Another great proof of the fact that Jesus Christ is God is Hebrews 1.8. But unto the Son... Oh, 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 oh. Yeah. This thing is really not easy to switch between, uh, by the way. Let's see. VLC and... Okay, here we go. Another great proof of the fact that Jesus Christ is God is Hebrews 1.8. But unto the Son he saith... Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. So what is the Bible calling the Son there? It's calling Him God. It says, unto the Son, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Listen to the NIV. But about the Son, he says. Recently I was talking to a Jehovah's Witness in the train station. I would pick my wife up. Mm -hmm. And the Jehovah's Witness was starting to read to me out of a devotional book she had, but I saw her New World Translation. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, is the New World Translation from the Greek? She said, it's from the West Gottenhort Greek New Testament. Mm -hmm. I said, is it accurate? She said, of course. I said, do you, have you had Greek? She said, no. I said, what would you do if Jehovah himself spoke to Jesus and called him God? Mm -hmm. That never happened. So I quoted for Hebrews 1.8. Under the sun he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Uh -huh. She became so excited, so upset, she took her bags and rolled out the door, and I followed out the door talking to her. <laughs> but when I read it from the New World Translation later, it completely has been changed. Mm. Whereas in the... Okay. Uh, wait a minute, let me make sure... King James, you can't misunderstand it. But not only that, but they attack Christ's virgin birth. Okay. Um... <laughs> Again, it's so frustrating. Uh, they throw out the, the New World Translation at Hebrews 1.8, which says, God is your throne. Now, that's a possible translation. It's an unlikely translation, especially in the context, but it has nothing to do with Westcott and Hort. It has nothing to do with the underlying text. They've made it sound like it does, but it has nothing to do with it at all. They mention Westcott and Hort, all the rest of this stuff, 
It's a translational issue, and you need to deal with it contextually. The only thing they threw out was, well, the NIV says, but about the sun. As if there's a difference? There's no difference. There's none whatsoever. In fact, you follow that, and again, the text is the same, the Greek text is the same. You follow that down to verse 10, and there's your strong, your strongest text for the deity of Christ, because there you have Psalm 102, 25 to 27 being quoted and applied to the Son, but of the Son and, and then verse 10 is cited. So these guys stand up there and they tell stories about dealing with Jehovah's Witnesses. The fact is they don't deal with the best Jehovah's Witnesses at all. None of them have. And by promoting their King James onlyism in the context of pretending to prepare their people to deal with witnesses, they're actually crippling them. They're crippling them because they're not giving them the truth. And the witnesses are smart enough to catch that and to take them apart, take them down at the knees. Got room for one more. This is, again, every one of these addressed in the King James only controversy, thoroughly refuted. Do they even mention it? No. King James, you can't misunderstand it. But not only that, but they attack Christ's virgin birth. Go to Luke chapter 233. The Bible says, and Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. The NIV, on the other hand, and the ESV, and the New Living Translation say, the child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. So right there we see that the NIV and these... Now, let's, uh, again, addressed clearly in, uh, in the book, but I, 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 want to, I want to point something out to you. He knows what the answer is here. He knows what the answer is here. Um, Joseph... Notice uh, you have, well, I, actually, I don't have this up right now, but uh, don't, don't worry about it. Uh, verse 33, uh, his father and his mother were amazed uh, concerning the things uh, spoken about him. Um, later, I'm sorry, uh, later translations uh, put in the word Joseph to later versions, such as uh, Theta, Family 13, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, uh, Pater is found in uh, Sinaiticus, Vaticanus, D, W, Family 1. Uh, it's basically in the uh, uh, Alexandrian text, so on and so forth. Um, now, what they say is, oh, this is denial of the, of the virgin birth. Later on, Mary will say, your father and I were searching for you. Showing that, obviously, this is exactly how Joseph functioned, and it was appropriate to use this language. They know that this is the case. And so what do they do? Listen to the manhandling of that text you're about to hear from Anderson. Other modern versions are calling Joseph the father of Jesus Christ, something that the King James Bible is careful to never do. Was Joseph the father of Jesus Christ? No, he was not. He was the stepfather of Jesus Christ, I'll give you that, but he was not the father of Jesus Christ. In fact, later in this same chapter, Mary refers to Joseph as Jesus' father. And he corrects her immediately. It says, when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. So didn't she just refer to Joseph as Jesus' father? Watch how he immediately corrects her. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? He's saying, look, I'm about my father's business when I'm preaching the word of God because Joseph is not my father. God the father is my father. People who believe... Now, now, excuse me. That's not what the text is about. Where did you get that from? Wow, when you can, when you can completely change what Jesus is saying into a rebuke of Mary for having used pater just to defend the King James and its reliance upon later manuscripts at Luke 2.33, there's, there's nothing left that you don't, you're not going to change. There's nothing left. There's, there's, there's no rules left.
No rules left. Amazing. Again, every single one of these texts refuted 20 years ago in the King James Only Controversy. It's sort of funny that I stopped it right there. Because I don't know if you've got that up, but um, that's a small room with a few people in it. King James Onlyism is dying. And you might say, well, then why talk about it? Well, because it can still confuse people. And you need to keep telling the truth, be honest, in responding to these, these things until it's gone. Will it ever be gone? I don't know. I think so. I think so. I think so.